Hi everyone, I am Josephine Ren. Um, today I, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Burns. Professor Burns is the Sultan of Oman Professor of International Relations at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, where he served as faculty director of the Future Diplomacy Project and chair of the Middle East Initiative and India and e South Asia Program. He grew up in the town of Wellesley <laughs> and attended Wellesley Public Schools. Mm -hmm. He received a bachelor's degree in history from Boston College and a master's degree in international relations from John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Professor Burns served in U.S. Foreign Service for 27 years until his retirement in 2008. Among the many positions he held were State Department spokesman from 1995 to 1997, ambassadors to Greece from 1997 to 2001, ambassadors to NATO from 2001 to 2005. Professor Burns served on the board of several nonprofit organizations, including the Council on Foreign Relations. He is also a member of the American Academy of Art and Science, the Trilateral Commission, and Red Sox Nation. <laughs> <laughs> he writes um, a foreign affairs column for the Boston Globe. He is a member of the Secretary of State's John Kerry's Foreign Affairs Policy Board at the State Department and a director of Aspen Strategy Group. Professor Burns has received 12 honorary degrees, the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, the Woodrow Wilson Award for Public Service from the John Hopkins University, and the Boston College Alumni Achievement Award. Now, please join me to welcome Professor Burns. Thank you. Thank you very much. Josephine, thank you very much. That was a very kind introduction. Uh, good, good morning to everybody. It's great to be back in Wellesley. It is my hometown, so I'm <laughs> proud to be here. And I'm very proud to be here, I think, I don't know, for the fourth or fifth year. I'm not sure I've been here every year. This is my fifth year out of, I missed one, my fourth year. <laughs> so um, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome all of you here and to congratulate <coughs> you for being named Albright Fellows. Um, I'm a great admirer of Madeleine Albright. I had the huge good fortune to work for her when she was Secretary of State. I was a career Foreign Service officer. If you're interested in international politics and you're an American, you might think about the Foreign Service as a career. So I started in my late 20s, served for 27 years, uh, worked for Republican and Democratic administrations, and when Secretary Albright became Secretary of State, I was the spokesperson of the State Department, and I was her spokesperson for the first eight, month of her, eight months of her time as Secretary of State. And I admire so much about her. I know you, you talked to her on Skype yesterday. <laughs> you'll, you'll see her in person here at Wellesley in a couple of weeks and she'll be with you for a couple of days. She's a remarkable person. Uh, so I was thinking this morning, what do I really admire? I admire so much about her. What do I admire most about her? Um, she has a compelling life story. And I think you're probably all familiar with that life story. But if you're not, you know, just Google her or read her biography at Albright Associates, her consulting firm or Georgetown, where she works, where she teaches. But to come to the United States as a refugee, uh, having been driven out of her country as a young child by the Second World War and then driven out of her country again by communism in the late 1940s uh, to make her way as a young teenager in an American high school to come to this great college and to succeed the way she did. Uh, it's a remarkable story of survival uh, against great odds. And so um, read her story. She's written a great book about the beginning of her life called Prague Winter. In fact, I went with her to Prague two years ago, two and a half years ago, just after that book had been written. And we were there for an Aspen Institute meeting, and she is a rock star in the Czech Republic. She is, I think, probably the most famous Czech uh, who left the country and did great 
in her adopted country. They love her there. Uh, but this is a wonderful book, if you haven't read it, Prague Winter, about what it was like to go through the Second World War as a very, very young child, and then to go back to the Czech Republic, and then to be driven out, her father and mother, uh, by the communists. Compelling story. So I admire that about her, just the fact that she's, like so many Americans, uh, we have a great immigrant tradition here. It's the defining characteristic of the country. Uh, she has been tremendously successful, and I think represents that immigrant refugee community very well. Second, she's a person of huge moral courage. You don't often find that. You don't always find it, I should say. I shouldn't say often in politics and in government. You find smart people in government. You find people who are well prepared to lead, men and women. But what distinguishes good leaders from great leaders is the capacity, I think, to have moral courage. So when you face a really tough moral ethical dilemma, do you speak loudly? Do you stand up? Uh, and sometimes even when it's not popular to stand up and say, I dissent, or I think we should go in this direction, Malin Albright has never failed, I think, to stand up for human rights. That's one of the great hallmarks of her life and her time as a public servant. Uh, she serves as chair of the National uh, Endowment for the Democracy, and she spends a lot of her free time, and she doesn't have much free time, uh, you know, going to witness elections in difficult places, standing up for human rights violations in authoritarian countries. And I think she's a model of someone who, by her moral courage, is a leader in government and in public life. Third, she's an incredibly fun person, <laughs> which you will find out uh, when you meet her. And I thought the, the best way to, to uh, illustrate that would be to tell you, um, I, when I was her spokesperson, her first year as Secretary of State, we went to the ASEAN meetings. Anybody know what ASEAN stands for? Everyone should if you're a student. Anybody know what ASEAN stands for? A-S-E-A-N? ASEAN. Yes? Exactly right. Where are you from? I'm from Burma. From Burma. So you know a lot about ASEAN. <laughs> exactly. So ASEAN is one of the most important regional institutions in the world today. It's the group of Southeast Asian countries. Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, Burma, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei. Who have I forgotten? Philippines, yeah, exactly, major <laughs> exception. Uh, so they have an annual meeting every year. And it's such an important group of countries because, you know, they are the, they're in a key bridging role. Uh, if you think of China's interest in Southeast Asia, think of India's interest in its Look East policy in Southeast Asia, U.S., Russia, Europe, all focused on this dynamic, growing part of the world. So there's an annual meeting, and Putin shows up. And Xi Jinping shows up, and Barack Obama and John Kerry show up. And so in 1997, Madeleine Albright went to her first ASEAN foreign minister's meeting in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur. And I was with her. And there's a tradition that the ASEAN ministers have that the, during one of the dinners in the evening, every foreign minister has to sing or dance. <laughs> there's this, or karaoke. There is this culture that they want to um, be informal. And so every foreign minister has to put on a show. And her, the two predecessors of Madeleine Albright, both really fine gentlemen, Warren Christopher and James Baker, had refused. They didn't feel comfortable getting up on stage to sing or to dance or to play the piano or whatever you could do. Every other foreign minister did this. And to the shame of the United States, people made fun of us. They said, we're too formal, we're too stuffy, we're too impressed by ourselves. Some people even said it was arrogance that the American Secretary of State wouldn't, you know, get with the program. Mal we, we informed Secretary Albright about this national disgrace that we had faced. <laughs> and she said, I will get up on stage. She said, I have a horrible voice. Get her, ask her to tell you this story. So we, um, we decided, she decided that she wanted to sing, Don't Cry For Me, Asianis. <laughs> And um, we sat on a very long plane ride from Washington to Southeast Asia trying to write humorous lyrics. And she got up on stage. I was one of her backup singers. And um, she brought the house down. And with it, she humanized the United States. Here is the Secretary of State of the world's greatest power, not afraid to stand up and join in another culture's traditions and to be respectful. And that's how I saw Madeleine Albright that night.
And I was with her in Beijing last month, and we recalled that evening, so ask her about it, because she has a great story to tell about it. So I'm very pleased to be here, because I'm a gr very great admirer of Madeleine Albright. Here's what I want to do. Um, I've been asked to speak about um, U.S. foreign policy in 2015. So what does the world look like to President Obama and Secretary Kerry and all of us who are Americans or those of you who are not Americans who are studying in our country? Where, where are the opportunities? Where are the dangers? What could we accomplish that would be good and positive in the world in 2015? Um, I want to take you through what I think are the major challenges that the President faces first. Second, then maybe just talk with you a little bit about the, some of the great transitional changes underway in the world, the changes in balance of power that all of you are familiar with. And third, because I will have thoroughly depressed you by that point, because there's <laughs> a lot of bad news out there, uh, why should we be hopeful, whether we're American or from some other part of the world, why should we be hopeful about the human condition, about the world that we're all living in and that you're going to You'll all be leaders in once you graduate from Wellesley College. So I'm going to do that hopefully in a very simp simple, straightforward, economical way because I want to leave the majority of time for your questions and for your points of view because that's always the most fun and I think it's the, probably the best way to conduct this. So let me start by saying this. I think this is one of the most complex times globally that the United States has ever faced. Big statement. The United States has been a going concern since... 1789, when President George Washington took the oath of office after, after the Articles of Confederation. Um, I'm not saying it's the most dangerous time in American history. The most dangerous time was either the Revolution or the Civil War, the most defining event, I think, in American history, the Civil War. Um, but it's certainly the most complex time if you think about how the world is structured today. Because we're very strong, I would say, without wanting to appear arrogant in assessing American power, clearly the strongest military power in the world, clearly the most influential country politically, still the largest economy, and I would think, say, probably the most innovative economy in, in terms of 21st century metrics. So a country with enormous power, but a country that cannot be dictatorial with the rest of the world. We just can't get our way by announcing what we want to do. We need to work with other countries. We need to work with a rising China, which is second in almost all those categories I just cited. Clearly the second strongest country in the world. We need to work with the European Union, which as a block of countries actually has a larger economy, as a block, and has more people. There are 500 million people in the European Union. Very successful part of the world, allied to the United States, and yet independent of the United States. There's Russia. Russia, most people would say, futurists would say, probably a declining power. If you look at demographics, their population is going to diminish over the next half century. Tremendous rates of alcoholism and health problems, lowest, I think, standard uh, average life expectancy for a male now is 61, 62 years of age for an industrialized country. That's at least 10 years below uh, the average internationally, a country that in 2014 decided to invade another country and take part of it and annex it. So Russia's caused a lot of controversy, doesn't have a lot of friends in the world, but still one of the world's, well, with the United States, the world's largest nuclear weapons power, still the great space power, still a very proud country with great historical, literary, cultural traditions, so a country to be reckoned with. Up-and-comer countries like India, with its $1.2 billion people, I'm going there this week. Spent four days in Delhi, a very dynamic place under new leadership, Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Brazil, female leader, Dilma Rousseff, the president of Brazil, just re-elected. And Brazil's a country with enormous economic, natural wealth, and with a big role to play in South America. South Africa and Nigeria, probably the two leaders of uh, the African continent, both growing economically. In fact, you know, we have to alter our image of Africa. The traditional image of Africa is poor, suffering continent. Actually, I think six of the ten largest, fastest growing countries in the world the last couple of years have been in sub-Saharan Africa. Tremendous growth happening in Africa. Exciting place to be. So as the U.S. looks out in the world, we have to be cognizant of these huge changes underway. And I say it's the most complex time 
Because I do think, especially for your generation, you're going to see tremendous shifts in power in the world. Uh, to be very simplistic and very general, we're looking at a power change and shift from west to east. It doesn't mean the west is going to lose all power. The West has had the preponderance of power for the last four or five hundred years, economic, political, military power in the world. China, India, South Korea, Japan, Burma, Singapore are going to have more of that power in the future. It doesn't mean that power is not also shifting south from the north, if you want to look at it that way, to a country like Brazil or South Africa or Indonesia, because that's happening too. It just means that maybe we'll live in a slightly more democratic world where power, as Tom Friedman said, a flat world, power is going to be more evenly distributed around the world. So the U.S. as the leading global power has to adjust to that transition point. I think something else is happening too, and this is very much going to be part of what you are all going to face in your generation in the next 40 to 50 years. And you're going to lead us, by the way. Whether you go into government or business or science or teaching, whatever you do, you're going to be the leaders. So you have to figure out what kind of world we're going to live in. I think the biggest challenge for seven and a half billion people, and that's going to grow to about nine billion people by the time you're in mid-career, 20 years from now, uh, is that we're going to face transnational problems. And these are the problems that every human being will be affected by. The problems that are flowing under and over national borders. You know, you can no longer live in isolation on this continent, for instance, and think that the Atlantic and Pacific can protect us from the ills of the world, not in a globalized 21st century. Not at a time when the economies are more and more linked, when what happens in China has a big effect on the U.S. and vice versa, when we see whether it's Ebola or SARS or HIV AIDS, that public health becomes global because of jet travel because of the millions of people traveling, going back and forth every year. This is a very different time than 40 or 50 years ago. And these transnational problems, what are they? Climate change, trafficking of women and children, which is a scourge, millions of women's be women being trafficked yearly in every country in the world, including the United States, by the way, by cartels. Drug cartels, crime cartels, the threat of pandemics, we're seeing transnational problems that affect 195 nation states, and there are 195 members of the United Nations, and 7.5 and billion people. I think it's the first time in human history, your generation, when we can truly say the world is global. Life is global. The problems we face in the United States, well, some of them are unique to us, but most of them, most of the big challenges that I just mentioned, they're common to every country in the world, and therefore we have to think differently. We can't just think as Americans or Canadians what's best for us. Climate is the ideal example of this. We cannot succeed in the United States in defeating climate change unless we coalesce with 194 other countries. And we're going to see that big negotiation underway in Paris uh, at the meeting at the end of this year. Can we form a, a global compact to reduce carbon emissions to have a chance of saving the planet? not to be true, too dramatic. I think these transnational issues will be the core of what you face in business, in government, in teaching, whatever you do. And so by definition, we have to be more global. By definition, we have to speak other people's languages and learn them. By definition, we have to travel. By definition, I think you have to assume that even if you want a life in New York City for the next 40 years, part of that life is going to be very dependent on what happens in the rest of the world. And you're going to have to be globally minded. And if you're not from the United States, the reverse is true. But if you're not from the United States, you've already taken that step because you're here. And so you're already making yourself global in a very impressive way. I think that's the big challenge. And in a way, I think that President Obama, and I'm not being political here in saying this, I hope I'm not, um, is the perfect leader of the United States right now. Someone like him. He's post-Cold War. When the Cold War ended, I was working in the White House at that time for President George H.W. Bush in December 91 when the Soviet Union fell. He was at Harvard Law School. His whole professional life post-Harvard and post-Columbia and post-Occidental, the three places he studied, has been in the post-Cold War world. He doesn't have the baggage that people like I have. You know, I was a Cold Warrior. 
college, you know, it was the height of the Cold War, yeah, when I was at well, at, at, here in Wellesley High School within Boston College in the 1970s. My young uh, years in the U.S. Foreign Service uh, were all about countering the Soviet Union. President Obama has emerged as a professional at a very different time in global history. And given his unique background, the fact that he spent a lot of time in Indonesia as a kid, the fact that he has very close family members in Kenya, we've never had a president like this. I think he has an understanding that Americans need to shift to this more global perspective. And he certainly has done that in his life. And he's certainly doing that on climate change with the decision he's made to finally put the United States in a position of being a leader and of contributing as now the world's second largest com uh, carbon emitter, China, passed us. So I think in this respect, um, he is positioning us to be more globally minded as a country, and I really respect him for that. So that's the big basket of issues out there. For 2015, where are the challenges, where are the opportunities? I'd list a couple. First, the burning Middle East. I think you have to start with the Middle East. It's the most unstable part of the world, meaning the place where the greatest number of countries are in crisis, either revolution, and Syria is right in the middle of a revolution, or revolution in Yemen, or profound political transition, Tunisia or Morocco, or in existential crisis, Egypt, between the authoritarian government and the millions of Egyptians who are Islamists, who believe that society and politics should be structured more along religious lines, the Middle East is in a revolutionary, turbulent, transformative stage. Four years ago this month, the revolution started <coughs> in Tunisia. One person started it. One person who stood up against corruption, a fruit seller in Tunis. Then it spread to Egypt. And we all remember, and I'm sure you do too, you were in high school, I imagine, four years ago. Remember the hope that you felt? I felt hopeful as someone who had lived in Egypt and lived in Israel, lived in Mauritania, that the Middle East maybe was on the verge of a virtuous, democratic revolution that would spread throughout the region. I think President Obama thought that was at least a possibility. We were hopeful that young people who led this revolution, by the way, they were high school, college students, who led, they were unemployed people, who, some of them, who led the revolution, that they would bring a new era of political tolerance, of democratic thought uh, to their region. Fast forward four years to today, to January 6, 2015, there are 22 Arab countries, maybe one's better off. Tunisia just had elections, have able to unite their Islamist and democratic political wings into one political process, largely nonviolent but not free of violence. They have a, a better, I think, more sustainable economy than most of the other countries. There's some hope in Tunisia. There's a little bit of hope in Morocco. But other than that, you really have to look and say that every other country is probably worse off. Egypt, certainly. Egypt's the keystone state, largest state, most populous state, oldest civilization, the cultural and political trendsetter, it's still in crisis. It overthrew the dictator in January of 2011, Hosni Mubarak. It then had a democratic election. It elected a Muslim, elected a Muslim Brotherhood dominated government. The military then came back and overthrew that government to some popular acclaim, at least in the major cities, and then reimposed an authoritarian military dictatorship. But you have millions of people kind of outside the system. And the government has said to them, if you belong to the Muslim Brotherhood, you're a terrorist. How do you think they feel about their future with that government? I worry that Egypt is poised for further revolution in the years ahead. Think of Syria and Iraq. Now, Syria is a country of 22.4 million people. There are 11 million homeless. 11 million homeless. Half the country have lost their homes. They're on the run. They're living in tent cities, most of them inside Syria. They're trying to flee this brutal government that has been firing barrel bombs into Aleppo and Damascus, urban areas, to kill civilians, to terrorize them, to drive them out of the cities. And they're fleeing the hundreds, if not thousands, of rebel groups who frankly aren't much better than the government, whether they're left, right, or center. And the Syrian people are the victims in between this great struggle 
this huge civil war, if you've seen these heart-wrenching photos of Aleppo, the biggest city in the country, historic UNESCO city, completely destroyed. <coughs> it looks like Berlin at the end of the Second World War. I mean, Google Aleppo, look at what's happened to their cities. So people have been driven out. There are Syrian refugees in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Jordan, but most remain in the country. It's the greatest humanitarian crisis in the world today. And we can't get proper humanitarian aid into many parts because of this blockage at the United Nations where Russia, China, in league with Iran and Hezbollah are blocking all of the Security Council resolutions put up by the Europeans or the U.S. or India to get to channel more humanitarian aid into the cities, into the country. It is a full-blown crisis. I don't know if Syria can be put back together again in the next three or four years. It has been so completely destroyed physically, but also because of the politics. Assad, Bashar al-Assad, the authoritarian leader, is just strong enough to survive. But he's not strong enough to control the country anymore. The rebel groups are weak, just weak enough and not united enough to be able to overthrow him. I think you have to analytically say we're looking at another year or two or three of outright, full-blown civil war in Syria. And think of the impact on Lebanon. Poor Lebanon, which is a very unstable country in the first place. Think of the impact on Iraq. One illustration, ISIS. ISIS, born in Syria, Sunni-led, has taken over almost all of northern Syria and very dramatically in 2014 moved out in this very impressive but deadly military offensive to take control of western Iraq, of Anbar province. They've taken over Fallujah and Ramadi. We Americans know those cities. Our Marines fought for them in 2003, 4, and 5, again in the surge in 2007, 8, and 9. They're now ISIS-led. ISIS executing many, many, many more Syrians and Iraqis than foreigners, but has executed in the most brutal and reprehensible way these journalists and aid workers. And that's who James, Jim Foley, Stephen Sotloff, Peter Kassig were. They were not American government officials. They were not military. They're aid workers and journalists trying to tell the story, trying to bring aid to people and yet they lose their lives at the hands of this vicious group. The Middle East is burning, tremendously unstable, and the United States has profound interest there. We're still certainly the most powerful outside player. We have alliances and partnerships throughout the region. Think of our relationship with Saudi Arabia, with Kuwait, with the United Arab Emirates, with Egypt, with Tunisia and Morocco, with Israel. And so President Obama has been trying to do the impossible here. He's been really trying to juggle these competing American interests between our concrete interests in oil, in gas, in economics, in stability, with our more virtuous uh, interests of democracy and human rights. And you can see these difficult decisions he has to make. Bahrain's a good example. Bahrain is a country with a Shia majority, but the government is Sunni, the royal family, and they've been arresting young people your age, Shia who have been demonstrating against the government, putting them in jail. And the U.S. could take the side of the demonstrators, but if we do that, well, of course, we'll antagonize Saudi Arabia, the great patron of Bahrain, and antagonize the Bahraini government. So the president has this choice to make. Do I side with stability, support the government, or do I side with revolution, with change, with human rights? And this is, a, by the way, a balance that we find throughout American history between our ideals and our self-interest. It's the balance between realists and foreign policy, those who think we should really promote our concrete interests like oil and gas, economic interests, business interests, and those, on the other hand, who think that, no, we have to stand up for our democratic values. I would say that Malin Albright, but you ask her this question, is someone who's been more on that liberal idealist side in her life and career than the realist side. You might say that Henry Kissinger, another Secretary of State, is more the prototypical realist. But the President's facing these really tough challenges. What does he do? What choices does he make? Short-term stability versus long-term change. And when you get into power, when you all occupy positions of power in government in the years ahead or any place else, you find that these choices are incredibly difficult. President Obama said it was in, it was in box, in the Oval Office. He said, you know, think about my inbox. He said this in 2009, his first year, is that I get all the impossible problems. Because if, if they were easy, somebody below me in the government would have resolved them. They wouldn't 
get to my desk, I get the problems where the choice is between bad or worse. It's not between good or bad. These are very fine gradations of difference sometimes. What do we do in the case of Egypt, for example? So responding to the Middle East, trying to stabilize the region, trying to use American influence, European influence, Asian influence to try to help economically, big challenge for the president in 2015. That's number one. Number two, certainly coping with Vladimir Putin in Russia is another great challenge for 2015. The, the challenge that Putin presents to the Europeans and to the Americans and Canadians in particular is this. We have an international system after the Second World War that's built on rules. And one of the most sacrosanct rules of the United Nations, and Secretary Albright served there as ambassador for President Clinton in his first term in office, the most sacrosanct rule is sovereignty and territorial integrity and inviolability of another country's borders. After the First World War and after the Second World War, when so many borders, think China, China was pulled apart by the imperial powers in the 19th century, invaded by Japan in the 20th century. Countries' borders have to be respected. If you're a member of the United Nations and there are 195, your borders are sacrosanct. No other country has a right to come across those borders and change them. That's exactly what Putin did in Crimea. Now, you can, the Russian nationalists will say, well, this was, Crimea was historically part of Tsarist Russia. Most Crimeans want to be part of Russia. They crossed the border militarily. They took it over. They kicked out the Ukrainian authorities. Ukraine was sovereign in Crimea. And then they annexed it by an act of the Russian Duma, the Russian parliament, and all that happened in late February and March of 2014. That was the crisis. And then President Putin went further. He put several hundred, in some cases several thousand, Russian troops secretly across the border into eastern Ukraine to destabilize the Ukrainian government. And he did that throughout 2014. He's still doing it. And that weapon system, SA-11, any aircraft system that brought down the civilian Malaysian airliner on July 17, 2014, was a Russian system brought across the border from Russia into Ukraine by the Russian military and given to these pro-Russia separatists, the rebels. And they fired that missile that shot down that airplane that killed over 250 people. So the crisis really one is really one of, of um, the sanctity of the international system, if you let Putin get away with this, Barack Obama or Angela Merkel would say, where does he stop? Might he then try to take more of Ukraine or Moldova because the Russians have had their eyes on Moldova? Or parts of Georgia, they've already taken over South Ossetia and Abkhazia. So where does it stop? And does this then become fundamentally destabilizing? I think what the president is now facing, our president is, how do you respond to this? And he and Chancellor Merkel, and by the way, she's probably the most important and powerful female leader in the world today, Angela Merkel. Tremendously effective politician, most respected German leader in many, many decades, certainly in a group of two or three most important global leaders and if you're looking for fe ro female role models, she's one uh, in terms of how she's leading today. She's been, I think, a stronger leader in countering Putin than even President Obama has been over the last uh, eight to nine months. So she, Angela Merkel and Barack Obama decided early on, we're not going to fight him for this. We're not going to risk World War III. You know, Russia and the United States are both nuclear weapons powers. If, if the armies clash, you risk a nuclear war. Not worth it. Um, we don't have an obligation to Ukraine militarily, not a member of NATO. We don't have a moral obligation to defend Ukraine, but we have a political obligation to try to counter what Russia is doing. So the, the um, instrument that Merkel and Obama have used is economic sanctions. And they've sanctioned Putin three successive times. And this has coincided with a dramatic loss of value of the ruble, with oil down to 51 dollars per barrel as of this morning. The Russian economy is really hurting and the betting is, or the strategy by Obama and Merkel is, that Putin will be so weakened economically he'll have to sue for peace. He'll have to leave eastern Ukraine. I don't think he'll give up Crimea. So if you're the President of the United States or the Chancellor of Germany, is that the right strategy? 
They'll have to look at that in 2015. That's a second big challenge after the Middle East. Here's a third big challenge, which I think is the most interesting of all. And I think for you, it's how do we handle China? And for you as college students, this will certainly be the most important challenge that America face, is facing in the next 50 years. Because China is the great rising power in the world. And you might think of our relationship with China as um, a dual relationship. On the one hand, we have almost a symbiotic economic relationship with China right now. Think of, you know, think of the iPhone. I've got it somewhere here. This is the iPhone, right? New iPhone. This iPhone, the intellectual design, the engineering, uh, the marketing, the stylizing is done in California by Apple. But it's put together by Chinese citizens. It's the perfect example of this new relationship between China and the United States. We're the two largest economies, we're the great trading <coughs> nations, and there's no question that we've got to retain a very close working relationship with China in the years ahead. I think everybody would agree with that, right? Here's the problem. We're, we're each other's greatest partner, in a positive sense, or each other's greatest competitor in a military and political sense. Because, see, the United States sees itself as the guarantor of power in East Asia. When we defeated Japan at the end of the Second World War, we never left. We still have American troops in Japan, 30,000. We have over 30,000 troops in Korea. We're defending South Korea from Kim Jong-un, another person who needs to be contained in 2015. The United States has military partnerships with Singapore, with Thailand, with the Philippines, with Malaysia, with Indonesia, with India, and an alliance with Australia and South Korea and Japan. So China is now pushing out militarily. It wants a blue water navy. It wants a navy that can go beyond its coastline and act strategically. China has, is a great nuclear weapons power. China is expanding, I think, its, its sense of itself under Xi Jinping, a very impressive, very assertive leader. Will these two countries collide in the next 50 years? We have to hope not, because these are two of the most powerful, two most powerful countries in the world. It would be a catastrophe if the U.S. and China fought. So what can your generation do? What must you do? Remain China's greatest partner. Um, resist, I think, from an American perspective, China trying to be aggressive against its, na its uh, neighbors in Asia, but avoid a war. That's a very fine balance to keep. How do you become someone's greatest friend and partner and greatest competitor? And that's the situation that China and the United States find themselves in. So I'd say the burning Middle East, the crisis with Russia, how to work with China and keep the peace with China and yet not be dominated by China, and these great transnational issues that I talked about, put that in a basket of four big issues that President Obama and the United States need to tackle in 2015. And then there's all sorts of smaller crises. Contain Kim Jong-un, 31 years old, no previous employment experience, no previous management experience, owner of a nuclear weapons force, only American who has a relationship with him, Dennis Rodman, very good, very good basketball player, but you know, not a diplomat. I'd rather have Barack Obama and John Kerry talking to the North Koreans, but that's not happening because we're estranged from each other. So how do you contain this country, this very isolated, kind of throwback regime, communist regime, and not have that regime cause trouble with South Korea and Japan? That's a big problem to add to the mix. Iran. Haven't talked about that. How do we stop Iran from becoming a nuclear weapons power, but maybe by negotiation, not by military force? President Obama's focus on negotiation and diplomacy. How do we avoid a war with Iran, but prevent them from becoming a nuclear weapons power? Let's talk about that. Um, how do we, I know you're studying the MDGs and you're thinking about development. How do we address global poverty? President Obama's concerned about that. He should be, we all should be. If you think of seven and a half billion people, how many would be technically poor under the UN definition, which is if you make $2.25 a day or less, you are technically poor? We might think of, I don't know what the exact answer is. I would think it's above two billion. I would think, I could be wrong about that, but I think it's well over a, mil a billion. 
of seven and a half billion. India alone has six to seven hundred million people living at or below the poverty line. China has hundreds of millions of people near the poverty line. Brazil still does in the northeast of its country. We've got poverty in rural America and in urban America. We've got a growing income inequality gap, which is really worrisome for the social fabric of the United States. So I think you're right to focus on this issue of development in its broadest sense. It's going to be a very consequential year, and that's how I'd frame uh, these challenges for the U.S. Now that I've thoroughly depressed you, and my wife Libby, who sat through far too many of my talks, said to me about a year ago, she said, you know, you're depressing everyone by talking about all these problems out there. Is there anything to be hopeful about? And I actually sat down and I asked some of my students, what are you hopeful about? I came up with the following list. I'm going to close on this. After all those problems that I gave you that Obama and Americans need to face, what are we hopeful about? Number one, our economy is rebounding. As far back as the when you were in middle school and high school, our economy has been in crisis. Think of September 2008 and the recession and near depression that President Obama inherited when he came into office. We're now growing. We're growing right now at what, 3% per year? Around 3%, Joe? Um, we're among the great powers, one of the fastest growing powers. And it's very important for global economic stability that the United States and China continue to grow economically, continue to give young people a chance to have jobs, meaningful jobs, when they come out of our colleges or high schools or vocational training institutes. So we can be, I think, encouraged by the growth of our economy. We can't be complacent about it, but that's important. Second, U.S. energy independence or U.S. energy security. We're not absolutely independent of foreign oil. We still import from Venezuela, some from the Middle East, a lot from Canada. But if you think of the United States, Canada, and Mexico as an economic unit, NAFTA is a free trade bloc. The energy power that Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. bring to the world, the rise of shale gas and shale oil, the boom in the Midwest and the mountain states and North Dakota has made the United States well, we're on the verge of becoming the largest oil producer in the world and the largest gas producer in the world. We never thought we'd be in this position 10 or 15 years ago. This gives us some independence from the uh, Arab regimes of the Gulf and from the fires burning in the Gulf. It returns some prosperity to the United States. It lowers prices, hopefully. I paid $2.49 per gallon for unleaded gas when I last filled up my car. A year ago, I would have paid $3.59 here in Wellesley or in Cambridge where I live. All good, and we should think about U.S. energy security. If you want to read someone really smart on this subject, Megan O'Sullivan, professor at the Kennedy School, a good friend of mine, she's writing about the strategic implications of the big energy changes around the world. It's not just North America. It's Brazil, which is a rising energy power, right? It's Russia, of course, which is still an energy power. These big changes in the energy and gas situation, how do they have an impact? What kind of impact? on the global balance of power. She writes about it. If you Google her, look at her in the Kennedy School website, you'll see some of what she's written. I'd recommend that to you. That's the second reason to be hopeful. Third, and this has, I think speaks directly to your future, the U.S. has, I think, an abundance of 21st century economic skills and attributes that will work well with the 21st century global economy. If we're going into a knowledge economy, away from just a manufacturing economy, which is what we were until after the Second World War. Um, Silicon Valley and its virtuous relationship with Stanford. Kendall Square, Cambridge and its virtuous relationship with MIT. Research Triangle, North Carolina and its virtuous relationship with the University of North Carolina, with NC State, with Duke. Uh, we're seeing ideas spawned by 19, 20, and 21-year-old students, right, at MIT, Stanford, Duke, UNC, University of Texas, University of Illinois, all across the country. And those ideas become apps. They become technologies. They become businesses. How exciting is that? And for your generation, what a great opportunity if you're scientifically, technologically minded, and all of us should be, at least literate scientifically and technologically, if not expert. I know Wellesley is making a commitment in this area. 
what an exciting thing to produce advances of knowledge, which is the core, the core mission of the, of the college and a university is the pursuit of knowledge. So that idea is spawned here at Wellesley. You find some venture capitalist in Boston or Cambridge to fund your project. You build a company. You create wealth. You employ people. You do some good in the world by producing the iPhone, as Steve Jobs and his team did. What a great opportunity. We do that probably better, the innovative end, the higher educational end, the venture capital end, and the technology end, probably than anybody else. We have a comparative advantage. We're not the only ones in the space. The Chinese are in the space. The Germans are in the space. The Indians are in the space. But we're doing more of it. So think of that as a great strength. Universities with business ideas, the union of all that for the United States. That's third. Fourth, the great powers are at peace. Why is that hopeful? <coughs> because the great powers haven't been at peace for most of human history. For the last four or five hundred years, the great powers tore apart Europe. In the First World War, 100 years ago, 16, 17, 18 million, no one is sure, people, human beings, men, women, children, died between 1914 and 1918 in Europe. In the Second World War, if you date it from the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931 to the end of the war, September 2nd, 1945, the war in Asia, the war in Europe, 60 million people died. Six zero. Sixty million people died between the 1930s and 1945. Sixty million. Is that roughly the population minus a couple of million of France, Italy, and UK? Yeah. Think of everybody dying in France. Think of the impact on China, on the Soviet Union in the 1940s of losing. The Soviets lost 20 million people, a third of the dead in all continents. Chinese lost millions of people. We lost, I think, 417,000 people. We were the power that didn't have the war fought in its own soil. We were lucky. We've got nothing like that on the horizon today. Nothing like that. If we're smart, if we focus on keeping the peace between China and the United States, Germany and Russia, India and Pakistan, countries that if they collided, catastrophe, for the human race. We've got nothing like that on the horizon if we focus on peacekeeping, on <coughs> learning how to manage our differences, not by fighting, but at the negotiating table, and Madeleine Albright personifies that. So I'm hopeful about that. And last, I'm optimistic about the United States, the last thing I'm going to say. Not that we don't have problems. I worry about our racial divisions. I worry about the legacy of Ferguson, the decision, you know, the the failure to indict, when you see someone put in a chokehold on a video, you look at that and you say, how does our justice system not respond to that? Think about income inequality. Think about the gun problem in America. Think about continued racial discrimination. Think about the fact that women still don't have an equal deal in America, despite our advances. We don't. So we got lots of problems, but we got lots of strengths. And it's not so much the economic, political strengths. It's, the, I think, the strength of our democratic institutions. It's the continuity of our history. It's our immigrant-based culture, which is the huge strength, I think, of the future of the country. I'm bullish on America, despite our many problems, and I'm hopeful about that, too. Thank you very much for listening to me. Let's talk about all these issues. So what's on your mind? Um, we can talk about any issue that I've mentioned or haven't mentioned. I can't guarantee the answer. We can talk about careers and how you might think about your careers or opportunities after Wellesley or opportunities for internships. And I'll just call on people. And if you would just let me know your name, maybe where you're from, what you're majoring in, that would be helpful. Yes? Where are the uh, We have one right here. Hi, my name is Charlotte. I'm from Wisconsin, and I'm an environmental studies major. Great. I have a question that's more sort of about your career, which I know you haven't really spoken about thus far. Um, as a member of the Foreign Service, your job is to advocate for U.S. interests and um, implement U.S. foreign policy. But has that mission ever conflicted with your personal moral or ethical beliefs, and how did you respond to that? Boy, what a great question, and a hard one, a difficult question. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, 
I just say one thing. Um, maybe I should say one word why I went into public service. So I was at Wellesley High School, just down the road. The Vietnam War was raging. I was a typical American kid of the 1970s. I hadn't been anywhere. I'd been to Canada, which is a great country. <laughs> but I'd never been anywhere else. And the war came into this town. And it came into every household in America. It was a defining event for our generation. And it made me, it forced me to, we didn't have an internet, we didn't have computers, to go to the high school library and to get an atlas out, where's Vietnam? I think when I was 14, I wasn't quite sure where it was. But everyone talked about it at our dining room table in my church, at our school. And that led me to, let's read about the history of Vietnam. And I think people I say, well, how did you get into public service? Vietnam War. It politicized me. It, made, it forced me to think about the world outside of Wellesley. It forced me to think about a country thousands of miles away. I was an altar boy at St. James Church here when I was a little bit younger. I served at two funeral masses for young guys from Wellesley who were killed in the war. That, that has an impact. It had an impact on everybody. Jane Fonda came here to the Schneider Center, actually to the church, to Wellesley College. I went and saw her. She was a great anti-war campaigner. She and her husband, Tom Hayden, came to Wellesley College. Friends of mine from high school came. I think it was 1972 or three. It just kind of pulled me out of Wellesley into the rest of the world. And I went overseas in high school. After that, I went overseas in college, studied, and just thought the most exciting thing I could think of was go out in the world, represent our country, try to not repeat Vietnam. So to simplify it, that's why I went into public service. Your question is a really good question. It's central and it's tough. Because when you serve in public life, if you're a mayor of, well, we don't have a mayor in Wellesley. We have a select person. If you're a select person here, a mayor of Boston, governor of Massachusetts, president of the United States, president of Burma, um, you're a public servant. You have to represent the best interests of the country or the city or state. And in my deal in the State Department and the White House was, when you work in the U.S. government, you have to be really loyal to that government. Uh, so if the president makes a decision, we're going to do X on Iraq or Syria or Brazil or India, you can't go out in the middle of the public square and publicly dissent. I mean, you can do it, but you'd have to resign. So it demands 100% uh, support publicly. And that's difficult because if there are thousands of decisions being made, the law of averages would dictate that you're not going to agree with everything the president does. And yet you have to support the president publicly. So the best example I can give you, when I was Madeleine Albright's spokesperson, I went out every single day and gave a live, unrehearsed, televised press conference with 50 journalists in the room. And um, I would go see Secretary Albright before each press conference and say, okay, I think I'm going to get asked questions on the following 15 issues. We had scoped out what, the, what was in the papers, what's in the news, what the journalists want to ask for. What do you want me to say on X or Y or Z? And, and I would be faithful to her. And I'd represent her viewpoint or President Clinton's viewpoint. In some of those cases, I probably was on the other side of the issue. And yet I publicly defended the government. Why? Because that's the deal in public service in any government. The, the idea is that inside the government, as decisions are being made, we argue. And we would have tempestuous arguments sometimes over what to do in Bosnia or in Iraq or with Russia or China. But once the decision is made, then the government demands 100% uh, support, 100% allegiance in public. Because you can't have a government where thousands of people are out criticizing President Obama, thousands of people in the government. And that's a very difficult deal to make with yourself. So I got some good advice when I was a very young diplomat. I think I was 26 or 27. I was in a training course in Washington before my first assignment in Cairo. And this guy came in and he talked to us about our careers. And he said, the most important thing I can tell you is this. He said, decide what you're willing to do for the U.S. government and what you're not willing to do. I mean, have this ethical line that you're always going to remind yourself is there. What am I willing to do and what am I not willing to do? I never faced a time in my career, truly, where I had a huge moral debate with myself. Is this really the right thing for me to be representing? Um, but friends of mine did. And the guy was very public about it, wrote a book about it so I can reveal this. I mean, he's public. Brady Keesling, very good friend of mine. He, was, he worked with me when I was ambassador to uh, Greece. He was my political counselor. When we invaded Iraq in 2003, 
He privately dissented within in the government, and then when President Bush went ahead and invaded, Brady resigned. He said, I cannot serve this government. My, mor my moral conscience won't allow me. This was such a big issue for him. And he resigned, and he wrote a book about it. He came all across the United States to college campuses, spoke against the war. You know what? I thought, good for him. You know, I, I didn't, I supported the invasion in 2003. I regret now that I did, by the way. I think we were wrong to invade, but I supported it then. So I didn't have the moral crisis that he did, but I thought he has the right to resign. He has the right to, uh, to dissent publicly. But if you're going to dissent in that kind of way, you have to resign. Uh, and so I think in public service, you're not a free agent. One more point just might help. My, my oldest daughter, Sarah, my, my wife and I have three daughters. She's 31. Sarah decided when she was in college, she said, Dad, I can't do what you did. I'm, my future is not with the U.S. Foreign Service. She said, because I have, she's very focused on human rights. Her whole career has been in human rights. She worked for a congressman, and she worked for Amnesty International. She volunteered for human rights organizations in India when she lived there. She said, I'm so focused on human rights, I could never work for the State Department and see decisions made where human rights might be compromised, where you might elect, you know, some concrete American interest over support for human rights. So she said, it's not for me. And so I think for any of you, you have to kind of make that basic decision. Do you want to go into public life? Do you want to serve in government? Do you want to run for office? What are the consequences for that? Or are you better off in a nonprofit, working for an organization that maybe speaks to your own personal values? We need men and women to do both, by the way. So government's a lot of compromising. It's a team uh, sport. It's an organizational, you know, being. And you can't always get your way. But I would say by the end of my career, I could say I truly felt that we made a difference positively in many respects. We made some huge mistakes. I thought the balance came out in our favor, but those are arguments you have with yourself and that history will have as we go forward. It's a really great question to think about. Thank you for asking it. Yes? Great. Um, and my question is... You're not a uh, Seattle Seahawks fan, are you? Yeah, go Seahawks, that's the world. Well, what happens when the Seahawks play the Patriots in the Super Bowl on February 1st? Who's going to win? I can't say. <laughs> We're all, the rest of us are Patriots fans here. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Right. Um, Seahawks are a great team. Yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how can we really be partners and unite and work together if and trust one another if there's still this you know, undercurrent of distrust <coughs> containing North Korea, handling China, you know, kind of keeping Putin in line. Um, and I think there's definitely this sense of this reluctance of relinquishing power. Um, and how can we justify staying on top in a world that's shifting east? And why is that necessarily a bad thing, not being number one? And I don't know. Really good, que really good questions. We could probably organize an entire course around it because it involves a lot of issues to think about. Um, the answer I give you is that, so my world, I was in diplomacy, I was a State Department officer. Um, my world was the world of exercising power on behalf of the United States. I worked for the United States government. Trying to do that <coughs> as often as we possibly could in a peaceful, nonviolent way. But sometimes using power, using military force to get our way. So an example of that would be the Bosnian War. I don't know if you, how many of you know much about it. Yugoslavia split apart into six different pieces in 1991. Two or three wars revolted, resulted from that. The biggest was the war in Bosnia, where the Muslim population was assaulted by an Orthodox Christian force, the Serb Army, uh, Bosnian Serb Army. It was a religious war for territory, for the future of the country. And between 1991, when it broke out, and 1995, when we finally stepped in, 250,000 people died. 2 million homeless, over 2 million homeless. We finally stepped in after the Srebrenica massacres of July 1995 when 8,000 men and boys were executed, Muslim men and boys, by the Serb army. We stepped in with military force in early September 1995 to bomb the Bosnian Serbs and to drive them to a peace negotiation. We got to that negotiation. It's called the Dayton Peace Accords in November 1995, and Richard Holbrook was able to negotiate a peace. It's an example where we used force, we thought for humanitarian ends, 
to protect the Muslim population of Bosnia and to defeat the Serbs and to weaken the Serbs so much that they'd have to sue for peace at the negotiating table, which is what has happened. It's not always as easy or simple. I think most people would look back and say that was an appropriate use of force. Most countries around the world supported us from, on a humanitarian basis. But sometimes you use power and you're wrong. And I give you the example of Iraq, 2003. I supported the war. I was a U.S. ambassador to NATO, our largest military alliance. I thought it was a difficult call. I didn't think it was easy. But I thought on balance that Saddam was a threat. I believed our intelligence that he had WMD. We were wrong about that. We were terribly wrong about it. We kind of waded into the war and succeeded in the first month to defeat him. But then we bungled, bumbled our way into an occupation that lasted for eight years. And if I could re-roll the film and start all over in the first frame, I'd, I would certainly say to my superiors of the President and Secretary of State, bad idea. But that's not how I thought then. So I think, you know, what was implicit to me in your question is a very good question is, we have to be careful about the use of force. It is by nature deadly. You can kill a lot of people. You can cause a lot of problems. You can also use it sometimes effectively, I think, as we did in Bosnia. So leadership that we've got to be good at is, just, is being able to distinguish when it's appropriate, when it makes sense to use force, when it's in the nation, national or international interest, and when it's not. When the risks are just too great, as I think looking back on it in March 2003, the beginning of the Iraq war, it clearly was. Um, we are in this very strange relationship with China and Russia. They're the two great authoritarian powers, non-democratic, uh, versus, say, many of the other Asian states, Japan, South Korea, Australia, Indonesia, democratic states, and the U.S., Canada, and the European states. There is an ideological split between the authoritarian states and democratic states because the authoritarian states, there isn't trust. You led your question with trust, which was the right word. We don't have real trust, especially in Putin, to a lesser extent in Xi Jinping. If you don't have trust, you begin to doubt people's motivations. You worry that what they're doing militarily is to counter you. You build up your military in opposition to them. You get into the situation we're in right now in Europe where there's a new dividing line appearing after the end of the Cold War between the Russia-controlled part of Europe and the German-influenced or U.S.-influenced part of Europe. And you get the same, have the same problem in, um, in Asia between a China-dominated world and a U.S.-dominated world. So you have to, you can't back down from competition, but I think you have to fight fairly and hopefully try to adjudicate your differences peacefully as much as that's as possible in the nuclear, chemical, biological weapons age. We could spend weeks on your question. It's so complex, so thank you for asking it. One more question. Okay, yes. My name's Helen, and I currently live in New Jersey. Uh, I'm an IRA econ major. So as someone who was born in China and has spent extensive time living in Asia, I'm wondering, um, so the U.S., when working with other countries, uh, the U.S. contemplate both ideal social responsibilities, democracy, human rights, and self-interest when making decisions. But a lot of the times, the countries that U.S. you know work with and need to uh, have relations with don't have the same, uh, aren't bound by these same rules, whereas they're not able to, um, they don't perhaps have the capacity to sort of put ideals before self-interest, and they are pretty much only concerned with self-interest in their decisions. And I was wondering, how does the U.S., you know, proceed with them if they're playing by different sets of rules, essentially? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, there's a great book called Ideals and self-interest, exactly the way you phrased it. In American Foreign Policy, written by Robert O. Osgood, probably in the 1960s or early 70s. But that book is still relevant. And it traces throughout our history this struggle that I talked about, that you referred to. How do you balance, if you're the President or Secretary of State, ask Secretary Albright this. This would be a great question for her. When you were in office, how did you balance your obligation to defend our concrete economic energy interests versus your obligation to stand up for American values. And there are trade-offs there. And it's the most difficult part of governing. It also sometimes 
sometimes describes differences between the two parties and how they think about power. I would say the Democratic Party, and Secretary Albright's an exemplar of this, would say, would put more weight on the ideals. Sometimes Republicans, sometimes, put more weight, but not exclusively, on the self-interest part. So it's a big schism, a big dividing line in American foreign policy, and it expresses itself in foreign policy. I'd say this. I think the role of the United States is very much tied to the ideals in the, in the UN, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the founding core document of the United Nations, 1946 or 47, I believe. I can't quite remember which year it was. And I think as Secretary Albright would say, that document's very important. The United States has obligations for international peace and security, for standing up for the rights of women, standing up for the rights of minorities, standing up for human political and civil rights. Authoritarian powers like China and Russia put much less, if any, emphasis on this. In fact, you have to say that the Communist Party of China uh, is not interested in promoting those ideals. In fact, is interested in blocking the expression of those ideals, at least in its own country. So there, that's where the distrust and the rivalry comes in. We have two very different ways of looking at the world, how human beings should be treated in our countries and universally around the world. And you'd expect me to say this, but I believe it quite fervently. I think the United States um, has the better system. I think we're right about democracy and human freedoms. And China is wrong, the Chinese government. I'm not saying the Chinese people here. And so part of what we have to do is hopefully over the next 50 years, win that struggle, win it. Liberate women and the cartels, right, of human trafficking. Pay attention to political rights, civil rights, uh, freedom of the press. And this is a big contest now between the authoritarian powers and the democratic powers. There are many democratic powers in Asia who stand up for these values. And many of them are members of ASEAN. If I can say this, as an outsider, there's a battle for the future of your country on this, on your issue. Whether Myanmar, Burma, will be a democratic country in the future, I think that's what Aung San Suu Kyi would say she wants. And some of the military say, no, we want a tightly controlled system where we control what people think and we limit what people can say. And I can't tell anyone here who's not an American, how do you go out and participate in that struggle, but there, there is a struggle underway. And I think the United States represents the democratic part of that struggle. We're the strongest democratic country. Um, and that gets to this very difficult relationship we got with China, where we're partners, but we're also competitors, and we're competing for ideas with China. I would just say this, uh, as I end. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, when he ended his presidency in 1909, uh, took a year-long trip around the world. He ended up in Paris at the Sorbonne. He gave a great speech. Google it. I think it was May 1910. He says something that was par for the course in 1910, but highly politically incorrect in 2015. He said, the credit belongs to the man in the arena. I would modernize Teddy Roosevelt by saying, the credit belongs to the person, man or woman, in the arena. But what he says is basically in that speech is this very famous paragraph. Might, if you Google man in the arena, you'll get this quote. And many of you probably have heard it. He basically says it's not the critic who counts. It's not the person who points out how the person in public life stumbles or fails. The credit belongs to the person in the arena of public service. You've run for office. You're on the school committee. You're working for an NGO. You're working for your government. You're in the United Nations. You're in the arena as a man or a woman. You're struggling to make the world better. Teddy Roosevelt said that's where the credit belongs. He said the credit, even if you fail, and this is his quote, you fail while daring greatly so that your place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. So what he was basically saying is you can't truly be human and test yourself if you don't go into that arena at some point in your life. Doesn't have to be every day of your life, by the way. But at some point, if you believe in something, stand up for it, run for office, particularly important for women, become president of the United States, become Secretary of State as two women from Wellesley College did, have done, hopefully more to follow, and get into that arena 
and battle for your ideals. That's a great quote. I always give that to my students at the beginning and end of each course. Thanks very much. Good luck to you for the next couple of weeks. Thanks for having me over. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you. Good to see you. Wonderful friends. Thank you.